reading from verse 16. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Why don't we pray after that? Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, what a, what a joy it is to be here and just to be able to uh, be with one another, brothers and sisters, worshipping our great God and King. Father, help us now. Help us to love you and your ways. Help us to love you and your word. And Lord, may we all come away from this service as men and women, earnestly desiring Jesus Christ above all. Father, we ask these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, Mr. Nose and Mr. Hand were sitting in the church pew talking to one another on a Sunday morning. The morning service, led by ear and mouth, had just come to a close, and Hand was telling Nose that he and his family had decided to look for another church. Really, Nose responded, but why? Well, I don't know, Hans said as he looked down toward the out-of-date and overly worn-out carpet. I guess because the church doesn't have what Mrs. Hand and I are really looking for. Well, what are you looking for? He asked. Hand had to think, and then he spoke. I guess we're looking for a place where people are more like us. We tried to spend time connecting with the legs, but that didn't really go down too well. They just kept talking about style. And we tried to uh, join the small group for toes and they just wanted to talk about socks and shoes and bad odours and that didn't really interest us. And we attended the Sunday school for the facial features but they just wanted to talk and listen and smell and taste and kind of just felt like no one wanted to get their hands dirty. Anyway, Mrs Hands and I were thinking about checking out the church over on the east side. We hear they do a lot of hand raising and clapping and it's a bit closer to what we need right now. Right, Nose replied, I, I think I see what you mean, brother, and we'd hate to see you guys leave, you are a blessing, but if you really believe that's what you need right now, then as sad as it is, we love you, and we hope you can connect. At that moment, Mrs. Hands, who had been caught up in another conversation, turned back to join her husband and Mr. Nose, and truth be told, Mrs. Hand, like her husband, wasn't really too sad about leaving the church. In the recent years, her husband had made just enough critical comments about the church that her heart had now begun to reflect his. The small groups were a little bit cliquish and the music was a little out of date and the programs did seem a little bit silly. And so in the end, it was hard for the two of them to put their fingers on it, but they had finally decided that the church just wasn't for them. So what about you sitting here this morning? What do you think should be in a church? What, what exactly are you looking for in a mature and healthy church context? Uh, perhaps you haven't thought about that question in a little bit. Perhaps you don't really care because you're just here to look for a future wife, young brothers. But, but take a moment now and ask yourself, what does the ideal church look like in your mind? What should a church be about? Maybe you think the music is the final deal breaker. You don't want drums and guitars ruining your worship. You want uh, an organ and a choir. Maybe the music's not important as the preaching. You want somewhere that has good sermons, faithful studies, meaningful but not heavy, biblical but not boring, practical but not picky. Or perhaps you're seeking a church where the people are the same as you. You're looking for a church that can meet your spiritual diet and challenge you in the right areas of life. What should a healthy Christian church be about? We all have theories and opinions and expectations that we look for. But the question today is, what about Christ? What does Jesus expect from his people, from his church? What does Christ believe that his followers here on the earth today should be about? What should we be doing for our good and for his glory?
Well, I think here in Matthew chapter 28, this question is answered. Matthew 28, I simply wish to point out three things that we see reflected in our passage that every true Christian church and every true Christian in a true Christian church should be thinking and reflecting week in and week out as they seek to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Three things I want us to be thinking about here this morning. Our commitment to Christ, our commission from Christ, and our confidence in Christ. Our commitment to Christ, our commission, and our confidence. Thank you, Kevin DeYoung, for that helpful outline. And our main point this morning will be this. Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth to build and to be with his people. Now, I just want to be clear before we begin. These three C's, they're not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive list. Uh, You can add or take away from these uh, three C's. But in a very real sense, this is at least the minimum of what a healthy church should be about. I originally titled this talk, uh, The Five Marks of a Healthy Church, but we thought that was a little bit too close to a pastor in the States. Craig's like, no, you're not doing that. I was like, okay. So I came up with those. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 28, let me, let me just set the scene for you here in Matthew 28. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28 is the final chapter. It is the last chapter in the book of Matthew. And if you know anything about Matthew's Gospel, he's taken us through quite a few themes and, and, and events that have taken place up until this point in redemptive history. He's taken us through the virgin birth of the Son of God. So that in the birth of Christ, we see the reality of God with us. He's taken us through the wilderness temptations of Jesus. And in the wilderness temptations, we see God sympathizes in our weaknesses. He's taken us through the proclamation of the good news that the kingdom of heaven is here in Christ. He's taken us and demonstrated that Jesus has the ability to heal the sick and the lame, to to cast out many demons and to upset many religious leaders. And right before our passage, he takes us to the cross of Jesus Christ and he describes in detail the death of the Lord Jesus, the burial, and the resurrection. And so all that's left for Matthew to do now in his gospel is to report Jesus' post-resurrection reunion with this weak and waning bunch of men. And that is our chapter here this morning, the final address that Christ gives to his disciples. Now, now, I'm not sure if this has ever occurred to you, but, but generally, the last words that are recorded of an individual are often seen to be the most important words of an individual. The last words of a person are like the finest piece of wisdom they have before they leave this world to go to the next. And so almost instantly, Matthew pitches up the significance of the words of Christ by identifying these as the last words recorded in his gospel. Now, we know that Jesus said other things outside and after the Great Commission here in Matthew 28, but the point is these are the last words that Matthew gives, and that's significant. Jesus is about to say something very important, and we, as his disciples, we must listen and obey. What are these last words or last events recorded in his gospel. Well, if you have your Bibles, Matthew 28, we're going to begin in verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Real quick, Matthew here wants us to see and be reminded about the tragic cost of what it is to be a disciple of Christ, but betray him. He uses this phrase, the 11 disciples, so that we immediately remember Judas and the tragic cost of a disciple who betrays their Lord. This is a somber beginning to a spectacular task. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Brothers and sisters, wherever you find the church of Jesus Christ, there you will find her worshipping him. Our first commitment to Christ is a commitment devoted to worship. The church of Jesus Christ worships Jesus Christ. Where there is no worship to Christ, there is no true church. You and I have been created by, designed by, fashioned by God to worship 
him. There is, there is something in the heart of every true believer who is in Christ. There is something in the heart of every true believer that when they see Jesus for who he really is, they will worship him. This reality was reaffirmed to me in my own mind only a number of weeks ago when I was chatting to uh, Richard in the office just a a number of weeks. Richard's one of our interns here at at, uh, at Grace, and and we're talking about uh, salvation and conversion and the true marks of uh, a person. How do we, we sort of ask, how, how does one identify a true Christian from a false Christian? What are the marks, what are the evidences we need in order to identify who is a true Christian believer and who is not and Richard, very casually in his serious English accent, he sort of he looked at me and he said, "All I really need to know is what do they think about Jesus? What do they think about Jesus? Do they love Jesus? Do they worship Jesus? Do they seek Jesus? Do they honor Jesus? Do they promote Jesus? If you if you give me the answers to any of those, he said, then I can tell you whether or not I believe." They're a Christian. Brothers and sisters, the Christian faith centers on Jesus. It adores Jesus Christ. It loves and it worships Jesus. Worship exists because God exists and God exists for the purpose of worship. Where you see the church of Jesus Christ, there you will see her worshiping. But notice, notice this, that when they saw him, they worshiped but, these three little words, but some doubted. Some doubted. There will always be present in the people of God men and women who are prone to weakness, fear, and doubt, Matthew tells us. I mean, how does one see the resurrected Lord from the dead and think to themselves, I'm just not too sure this really happened? I have no idea how that happened, but it happened. They saw the resurrected Christ. They, they witnessed his appearance, and yet some of them doubted. Now, perhaps this is like the women who had uh, fear and great joy. This is another way to say these disciples had fear and great joy when they saw Jesus. But either way, what we do know is that even amongst those who worship God, there has always been and will always be in the church of Christ people who are weaker in the faith. It reminds me of a story I once heard about the Archbishop of Canterbury and Mr. Butterton, the actor. The Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 1675, he was acquainted with Mr. Butterton, the stage actor. And one day the Archbishop said to Butterton, inform me, Mr. Butterton, what is the reason you actors on the stage can affect your congregation with speaking of things imaginary as if they were real? while we in the church speak of things real, which our congregation only receive as if they were imaginary. To which Mr. Butterton replied, well, my Lord, the reason is very simple. We actors on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real, while you in the pulpit speak of things real only as if they were imaginary. Friends, there will always be people present in the people of God, men and women, prone to fear, prone to weakness, and prone to doubt. Prone to speaking of things real as though they were imaginary. And although our faith may be weak and our doubts as numerous as the stars, we will worship our great God and King. Our doubts do not take away from the fact that we as God's people are committed to worshipping Christ. And so, Will Marie, Emma, your first commitment in this world as disciples of Jesus Christ is first and foremost to worship him. Before you are disciples making disciples, your first commitment is to worship Christ on your knees. Where the church of Jesus Christ is gathered, there she will be worshipping him. Secondly, where the church of Jesus Christ is gathered, there she will be making disciples. Point two, our commission. Have a look at verse 18. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, let me get the technical stuff out of the way so we can see the implications of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus wants us, first and foremost, to be disciples making disciples for him. His, his number one priority, his number one concern in these verses is discipleship. Jesus wants disciples, not just decisions, right? He wants commitment, not just converts. In the original language, uh, the word go is not a command. The word baptize is not a command. The word teach is not a command. The only command seen in these verses is the command to make disciples. Jesus wants us to make disciples because discipleship was at the very center of all that Jesus said and did. Jesus loved making disciples and he loves churches that love making disciples that look and act like Jesus. And so when we talk about disciples and discipleship, what we're talking about is teaching people to love and to follow Jesus. That's essentially what a disciple is, one who looks like Jesus and teaches others to look like Jesus as well. And so if the emphasis and the point that Jesus makes here, the command he gives is to make disciples, the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we make disciples for Christ? And that is why these three verbs, the going, the baptizing, and the teaching, they're being used with the command. Although they are not commands in the Greek, they're just as important as the command because the verbs qualify. They They describe to us what it means to make disciples. The three activities of going and baptizing and teaching, they qualify the process of disciple-making itself so that you cannot make disciples unless you go forth and tell people about Jesus. You cannot make disciples unless you're going forth and baptizing people because of Jesus. And you cannot make disciples unless you go forth and teach people to obey Jesus. Jesus. And so a better way to understand the Great Commission, I think, is to say, uh, as you're going, wherever you are, make disciples. As you're teaching, wherever you are, make disciples. As you're baptizing, wherever you are, make disciples. That's the first thing. The second thing is why this even matters. Why is it important to distinguish between the main command and the three verbs that follow? Why am I making such a big deal out of this? Well, here's why I think all of this really matters. I know the last thing you wanted here on a Sunday morning is a grammar lesson, but you're getting one anyway. So it's important to say this because I think we need to understand you don't need to be a full-time missionary in Asia to be obedient to the Great Commission. You don't need to go overseas to South America in order to obey the Great Commission. You don't need to go somewhere specific in order to be obedient to Christ, but rather, as you go, wherever you go, whatever you do, whoever you are talking to, tell them the gospel. Tell them about Jesus. That's the command Jesus is giving. That's what it means to be obedient to the command, telling people the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and raised on behalf of their sins, and being invested in their everyday walk of life. Now, God may be calling you to full-time missions. He may be calling you to the mission field right now, and that is a good thing. And that is also what it means to be obedient to the Great Commission, but it's not the only way, is the point that we're making. The majority of people sitting here today are not being called to the mission field proper because God has called you where you are currently in your life to make disciples for Christ. The point is every single Christian sitting here, no matter matter what context you are in, God has called you to make disciples. If you're a Christian here this morning, you are by virtue of being a Christian, a disciple-making Christian. If you are a Christian here this morning, you are by virtue of your salvation, a Christian who makes disciples, whether in the home, whether at work, whether in the neighborhood, whether overseas or just over the road, tell people about Jesus. Tell people about Jesus. Someone once said the Great Commission is big enough to fill the whole world and yet small enough for each and every one of us to play a part. The emphasis here in this passage is on making 
disciples. And that's why he gives us these three verbs, going, baptizing, and teaching. So we're going to breeze over these real quick just to, just to get an idea of what Jesus means when he says these three things. So, so let's look at the first one there, going. Going. Jesus does not expect the world to come to the church. He expects the church to go to the world. He expects that because we have the only message of hope and eternal life, that we would not withhold such good news, that we would go out into our workplace, into our neighbourhoods, into our communities, into the byways and the highways, and tell people the greatest message this world has ever seen. Just last week, I was at an outreach event in the Redland Bay area, and, and this event is run by churches every year, and it's put on to get uh, churches recognized in the community uh, and, and various other things. And, and there are a number of people of Grace Bible Church who were actually at this event um, telling people about Jesus. They were, they were asking them questions, you know, can I talk to you about Jesus? What do you, what do you think Easter's about? Things that were uh, a really good way to sort of get to know people and talk about Christ. And Dalton, one of our members here, you all know the fiery Mr. Dalton, he, he put his arm around me and he says, yes, bro. Because <laughs> he always starts conversations like this. He goes, yes, bro. He says, do you want some motivation for preaching Jesus to people? I said, yes, I, t- I do. I do, please. He said, he said, over 50% of the people out here, they're going to hell when they die. And we are the ones God has called. We're the ones God has chosen to snatch them from a burning building. And he's exactly right. Friends, people cannot be disciples of Christ unless they first come to know and love the message of the cross. We, brothers and sisters, we are the ones God has chosen to accomplish this task. We make disciples by going and telling people about Christ. The gospel is the only message that saves human souls. Secondly, Jesus says we make disciples by baptizing, baptizing those who profess faith in Christ. So in the book of Romans, uh, Andrew read this out earlier this morning. In the book of Romans, Paul says, some of the most clearest and profound statements on the meaning of Christian baptism and what it represents. So I'm going to read that out again because I think it is a really good verse. And so this is Romans 6. You want to turn there, feel free. Otherwise, I'll simply read it. Romans 6, and this is verses 3 and 4. Paul writes this. Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were also baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. A couple of things I simply wish to point out in this passage. Firstly, this passage demonstrates that what Christ commanded the early church did. What Christ commanded the early church did. From the earliest conception of the Christian church, friends, Christians have always baptized believers in Christ. This was, this was not just done by those who heard Christ give the great commission on the mountain that day. This was, this was done by Paul, who we know was not physically present when Christ gave the great commission that day. Even Paul, writing to these Christians to a church where he had never even visited before, assumed that they were practicing baptism. And so that's the first thing. The earliest Christian believers practiced the ordinance of baptizing believers. But secondly, and more importantly, as Andrew had already said this morning, Paul understood Christian baptism as a visual representation, a visual declaration of the glorious good news of the gospel. Paul wrote, assuming that those participants in the baptism process were already spiritually buried with Christ in his death and raised spiritually in his resurrection. So like just last week, we celebrated Easter. 
those two inseparable events that changed the history of the world. We celebrated the death of Christ on the Good Friday, and we celebrated the resurrection of Christ on Resurrection Sunday. And so here in Romans 6, Paul says that that baptism, Christian baptism, points to the reality of both of those days, that the Christian is crucified with Christ, that we have joined Christ in his death, but also that we've joined Christ in raising from the dead. And so we know that baptism doesn't save a human soul, but it simply depicts an outward experience of an inward reality. Baptism does not save. It affirms what has already taken place on the inside. Baptism is a visual representation of the spiritual reality of the gospel. Will, Marie, and Emma, your baptism today affirm that glorious reality. The reality where the living God, the living God of this universe has come into your life and taken out a heart of stone and replaced it with the heart of flesh. Your baptism today was a beautiful depiction of the truth of the gospel. And you have publicly professed the fact that you are a disciple of Christ. What he now hates, you hate, and what he now loves, you love. Baptism is a visual representation of the gospel. And thirdly, we make disciples, Jesus says, by teaching them to observe everything that he has commanded us. Above all brothers, above all sisters, above all Grace Bible Church, What the Christian desires most, more than anything else in this world, is to know God. This is their greatest desire and their greatest concern. The difference between us and the world, between a Christian and a non-Christian, between a person who loves Jesus Christ and a person who hates Jesus Christ, the main difference between these two people is knowing God. As one preacher has said, the cry of the Christian is the cry of the Apostle Paul in Philippians, that I might know him. The main difference of being of the world and being of Christ is the world does not know him and the Christian has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. If you are not currently pursuing knowledge and obedience of the gospel, then you are not currently pursuing the main thing of being a Christian. The main thing about being a Christian is knowing God. It's everything for the Christian. It's everything for the believer. Jesus assumed that every true believer of God would be intimately focused on knowing him and teaching others to know him. It's the reason we sing, the reason we pray, the reason we baptize, the reason we preach, and the reason for communion. It's the reason why we're all gathered here today. We want to know God. The true disciple of Christ desires knowing God. Discipleship is knowing and obeying, teaching them to observe, not just just listen and not do anything. It's, it's knowing, it's teaching and observing. It is seeing and believing. It is knowing and obeying. Being a disciple of Christ means teaching and obeying everything that Christ has commanded us to teach and to obey. And this leads us into our final point here today, our confidence, our confidence in Christ. Have a look at verse 18. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. This is perhaps the single greatest Christological statement that Jesus has ever made and possibly can ever make about himself. Bound up in this one verse is everything we need to know about our confidence in Christ and his ability to fulfill his Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus by God the Father so that we can know with absolute assurance that the task is going to be accomplished. All authority, all authority to forgive sin, all authority to defeat death, all authority to give life, 
all authority over sickness and disease, over the wind and the waves. I mean, this is Matthew's gospel. You ever read Matthew's gospel? All of these authority statements and authority claims Jesus is making all throughout his gospel, it all points to this one statement, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. And you hear that and you think, wow. But then you look at verse 20 and Jesus says this, and remember, the one with all authority in heaven and on earth is also the one who is with you always to the end of the age. So the very one who has all authority is now with us every step of the way. And if you are familiar with Matthew's gospel, you'll know that, that he begins his gospel like this, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And now here in the very last verse, the very last chapter, God with us. Friends, this, 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 sums up, this theme sums up the very heart, the very essence of what the Bible teaches. One of my favorite pastors in the States has, has made this claim, and, he, and I think he's, he's spot on. He says that from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible is summed up with three words, God with us. That's the story of the Bible, and that's the story we know and love as Christians. The Garden of Eden, it was the place where God and man would dwell in a loving and peaceful relationship by grace. That is God with us. Think back to the children of Israel rescued from the, from the land of slavery in the book of Exodus and God brings them out and he says, I did that. I rescued you because God with us. Think back to the tabernacle. Think back to the wilderness and the people of God building the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a representation of what? God with us. Solomon building the temple, God with us. Christ in his incarnation coming and dwelling amongst his people, God with us. Pentecost pouring out of the Holy Spirit, God with us. The new Jerusalem that we read about in the book of Revelation, God comes and he dwells once again with his people. Why? God with us. This is the very means, the very meaning and the message of the Bible. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so remember this, I am with you to the end of the age. I am with you, God, with us. That is our hope and that is our confidence in Christ. Do you know this Jesus, brothers and sisters? Do you know the man who is God with us. The good news of the gospel, friends, has been sung, it has been seen, it has been heard and proclaimed in every aspect of the service today. Friends, God is with us here today. And it would be foolish of me to assume that, that every single person here has met and is following the Jesus we see here in Matthew chapter 28. This Jesus here stands before you in Scripture proclaiming the truth. He has all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness here today. The Bible tells us that, that we have all broken God's commands. We have all fallen short of his holy standards. Each and every one of us have broken every single one of those and, and, and God stands ready as judge to judge everyone who would continue to reject and rebel this Jesus. But like we said, the good news of the gospel is that Christ, God's own son, God with us, he took on flesh, he's come into this world to live the life we could never live, a sinless life to God, we could never do that. And he died the death that we should have died on that cross. He took the, the, the pain, the punishment, the sin, and the blame that we all should have taken, that our sin deserves. And he rose victorious three days later from the dead, conquering death, conquering sin, conquering Satan. And one day, brothers and sisters, one day we will all meet 
the Jesus here in Matthew 28. We will meet Jesus who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And we will either meet him in his grace and his love because we have chosen to follow the one who gives eternal life. Or we will meet him in his fury and wrath because we've chosen to reject and rebel against God. All those who trust in his death and his resurrection to save them from their sin, all those who give up trying to earn their way toward God, who think we're good people, we're not. The Bible says that we are sinners and we need to be saved. And if we are to trust in this glorious Christ, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth to save us from our sin, then we too can have eternal life and a relationship with God. We were created to know and to love this Jesus. And he calls all people here this morning to trust in him, the only Savior who is worthy of our allegiance. Friends, if you don't know the real Jesus being presented to you here today, let me encourage you, talk to someone about it. Talk to your friend, talk to your neighbor, talk to one of the pastors, talk to me after the service. But don't leave this service until you know that it is well with your soul. Why don't we come before God in prayer now? Our gracious and heavenly Father, God, we ask that the truth of your word would impact our hearts here today. We pray, Father, that through this message we would know that you are the glorious, all-sufficient God who gives to us everything we need to accomplish this, this monumental task that is set before us, making disciples of all of the nations. We ask that the truth of Christ and his authority would assure us of your power and might, And the truth of his presence with us would assure us of your grace and peace. Father, I pray for those who are baptized today that this this baptism would not be seen as the end of their Christian faith, but only what appears to be the beginning of a lifelong process of faithful obedience and discipleship to Christ. Father, help us now as we sing and as we talk to one another that we would get a sense of the glorious commitment, a glorious commission, and the glorious confidence that we have in the Lord Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.